Hello, wonderful leaders, and welcome back to Boot Camp. Today, we are going to launch into the next part of our course. This month is all about body. We're talking about emotions and what's going on in our body, all the sensations, the way that our body moves, the way that we hold ourselves. That's the focus of these month's lessons. We're gonna begin with talking about emotions. What are emotions? Emotions, from the psychologist's point of view, have a couple of different things all put together. There's an emotional trigger. There's something that happens out in the world that triggers an emotion. That's what differentiates emotions from moods. Moods are just kind of appearing things. You feel a little off, you feel bad, you feel a little good, you feel a little stressed, but there's no trigger. A mood is much more low intensity, it's usually more passing, and there's no trigger. An emotion has a trigger. So-and-so said something, so-and-so did something. You are in a certain place and something happened in your environment that made you feel a certain way. That's the trigger. Then there's a couple other components. There's what's happening inside of your body. Every emotion makes you, your body feel a certain way. You get tense, your face has a certain facial expression, um, the way that your body moves, all of that changes with the emotion. Another thing is the way that your thinking goes. Your emotions will influence your attention, your perception, the decisions you make, what you're motivated to do. That's all your thinking, the things that are happening in your mind. The next aspect of emotions is it coordinates how you feel. This is the part that we think about most when we think about experiencing emotion. You feel happy, you feel angry, you feel scared. That feeling is a key portion of how emotions are expressed in us. And the last one is how we respond. Emotions impact the way that we engage in the world, the actions and the behaviors that we engage in. So trigger, what's going on in your body, going on in your mind, going on in your feelings, your heart, and then how we respond. And all of those pieces are what makes up an emotion. There are many, many theories about how those pieces all fit together. Some theorists feel like you have a trigger and automatically a whole cascade of things happens, which includes all of those different aspects leading ultimately to your experience of the feeling. I would like to put forward that there's a lot of evidence nowadays from a neuroscience and psychology point of view for what's sometimes called the constructed theory of emotion. This is a theory that's been put together by Schachter and Singer initially, but then also built upon by many other people, Lisa Barrett, John Ledoux, Fanslow. There's a whole group of people, all of whom are putting forward this idea of a constructed theory of emotion. The basic premise is that emotions by this constructed theory are not predestined. It's not a trigger response kind of thing. It's not like, you know, you hit your knee and you kick your leg. It's not one of those automatic things. Each trigger is shaped by a whole bunch of different things. It's integrated through our brains into a complete experience. Let me give you an example, we'll walk you through. So let's say you are on a hike and at the beginning of the hike was a warning sign that said danger, there's cliffs, there's rattlesnakes, um, please take a flashlight and please take some water. Great, go on your hike. You hear some rustling in the bushes and then you see a snake crawling across the path. What happens? That's the trigger, the snake moving across the path of your hiking trail. First of all, your body will likely have a response. You'll probably tense, you'll probably step back, you might have a little bit of a scared face. So your body is going to have some physiological responses to seeing that snake. A lot of that happens unconsciously without us being aware that our bodies and face are reacting in a certain way. The other part is what's happening in our mind. You might have a memory of seeing a rattlesnake or hearing about rattlesnake stories or knowing that a friend got bit and had to get a snake bite treatment. 
those memories are going to come up in your head and that's going to shape the response and what happens. In the constructed theory, you take what's happening in your body, what's happening in your mind, and you put those together. Your brain will integrate all of those things, which will lead to the feeling and the response. The feeling is, oh, I'm scared. Oh, scary. And you back away. You have a response of backing away. Um, shielding your children behind you. All of those different types of things. That is one way that a snake could be a trigger. But this is the beauty of the constructed theory. It's different for different people. Let's say instead of being on the hiking trail, instead of being there with a warning sign, you're at the zoo. You're there with your kids. You're here to see animals. Already the environment is shaping the emotion. Now you go into the reptile house and you see a snake. The body response may still have a little bit of that same thing. You may still get a little bit of a fear response. You may back away a little, especially if it's a really big snake. But your memories may be different. You may remember your science teacher having a boa constrictor inside of her classroom when you were in middle school. You may remember stories about how interesting snakes are from a nature documentary. Those memories and that emotion, or the, sorry, the um, physiological response integrates with the environment that you're in, and all of that together leads to not a fear feeling, but curiosity, interest, engagement, wonder. So the feeling that you have is really different, and your response, instead of backing away, is that your fear face melts a little, you get a little curious, a little hesitant, but you might step closer to the glass and start reading the information on the panel. That's why this constructed theory is so powerful, that this is an integrated thing that you can create and have influence over your emotions. For a leader, that's a really powerful way to work with one's emotions. As I said, some of this is not always conscious. It's not always coordinated. You might have a fear face, but memories that are more leaning towards curiosity. And so the brain trying to integrate those two is going to try to bring congruence, bring coherence to the experience. If you think about constructed theories of emotion, what that means is that there is a huge spectrum of emotion, different intensities, different combinations, different mixes, that leads to a really, really rich emotional world. There are clear patterns across people, cultures, and ages. The role of emotion within human beings is first to coordinate our responses. It is really evolutionary beneficial to when you see a snake, to have a coordinated physiological and mental response to what you see. There's a reason why emotions exist. There's another reason as well. It offers social cues to other people that you are with. It tells them what you are feeling and it gives them cues and information about how you're likely to react. With all of that, that's going to help you become a better leader. So one of the things that has been very popular in the leadership literature is the idea of emotional intelligence. By emotional intelligence, what we mean is how well do you handle the emotions that are expressed by yourself and by others? How do you handle emotions when they come up for your own self and for those people around you? There's a couple components to that. There's awareness and there's management. Are you aware of the emotions you're feeling? And are you aware of the emotions others are feeling? Can you read their cues? Then there's managing. It's self-regulation. Can you regulate your own emotions and understand what you're feeling and how do you manage that in actual day-to-day -day life instead of letting the emotions overtake you? And how can you manage emotions within relationships with other people in social settings? There's been a lot of research in the business schools and in psychology showing that people with greater ability to handle emotions have higher performance at work, they have better relationships both at work and at home, they have higher senses of life satisfaction, 
and they're more happy. So improving your emotional intelligence improves such a huge wide range of who you are in this world. And that's what we're going to focus on. What are some tips for how do you manage your own emotional intelligence and get better at it? This is a skill that you can practice. We're gonna to focus today on the awareness part, being aware of your own emotions and aware of the emotions in others. First, let's turn to self-awareness. You may have like a gut feeling every once in a while, a feeling like intuition or some subconscious feelings about things. A lot of our intuition is based on subconscious awareness of your own body's cues and the cues that are given off by other people. There's a whole bunch of nerve endings that go from our brain down into our gut, our heart, our lungs, our major muscle groups, and those nerve endings come back to our brain to give us information about what our body is doing. There's also a lot of information that comes from other people. Information about what's their body language, what's their face looking like, how do their eyes work, and a lot of the interpretation of that is unconscious, both the ones that are coming up from our own bodies and the cues that we're receiving from others. That sense of intuition, that little weird gut feeling, actually has a lot of information for us and is a really great place to start in terms of our own self-awareness, just tuning into your sense of intuition. One of my favorite books of all time is Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. And in it, she says, when we don't have the language to talk about what we are experiencing, our ability to make sense of what's happening and share that with others is limited. We need language, we need words and vocabulary to begin to take intuition and put it into words, to take the feelings that we're having and to put those into words so we can not only get a better sense of what's happening for ourselves, but we can communicate it to others. There was this fascinating study by Mark Fenton O'Creevy on stock traders, people who trade stocks for a living. One might assume that stock traders will do better if they purely focus on the logic and the data and understand what's going on from a very logical problem-solving mental point of view. The researcher, Mark, he tried to see, is that really the case? What he found was really different. He found that the most successful stock traders were the ones that were most likely to acknowledge and rely on intuition, especially in cases where there was limited information. When you didn't have enough data, those stock traders who kind of listened to their intuition and started to acknowledge and name their gut feelings, I'm not feeling really good about this one. This one is a little scary to me. I'm gonna go this direction instead. By following their intuition, they actually did better and made more money. When you can do that, when you can start to learn to listen to your intuition and not suppress it, but actually bring it to the forefront and use it, especially in those cases with limited information, it has a real beneficial impact. What about strong emotions? Like we're talking about everyday emotions right now. What about the really big stuff, grief, when somebody that you really love passes away? What about rage, when you get so angry that you can feel the blood boiling and you're seeing red? What about terror, the things that bring on panic attacks? Those are really slightly different cases, but still the same thing applies. Being aware, not suppressing, not ignoring. It's harder though, because when you have these big, huge, overwhelming emotions, it's really tempting to squash, compartmentalize, and push aside. The way that I'd love for you to think about it though is think of your emotional experience as a tunnel. And you have this young child, a part of you, who is experiencing that emotion. You have a young child who is terrified. You have a young child who is grief-stricken. What would you do 
as a wise, responsible adult to help that child? Well, I know that I wouldn't tell my daughter, oh, push it aside, grow up, ignore your emotion. No, I'd crawl down in the little hole and say, oh my gosh, you look so scared. What's going on? Tell me what's happening. You'd be emotionally empathetic. You'd care for and spend time in and help that child process their emotion. And when they're ready, you'd say, here, hold my hand. You don't have to go through this alone. Let's walk through this tunnel of sadness or fear together. That is, by all the psychologists and psychiatrists, the most beneficial way to navigate an emotional landscape is by actually acknowledging and taking advantage of that emotion and allowing a person to fully move through that experience. What about other people's emotions? There's a way to practice recognizing and naming other people's emotions as well. And in fact, while it seems a little bit scary, there's actually research that suggests that if you acknowledge and recognize the emotions in others, that they will have more trust in you. The research was done by Alyssa Yu, who found that when you, in a work setting, notice something like, oh, you looked upset right then. You look a little angry, what's going on? That when you do that type of emotional acknowledgement, that those people you speak with have more trust in you. It is a risk to be able to step out there and try to name someone else's emotions. In fact, it's likely to sometimes get it wrong, especially as you're learning to read other people's cues. So I want to encourage you to both try to recognize emotions in yourself, but also out loud, acknowledge the emotions in other people and go ahead and express that observation and see what response you get. Excellent. That's the lesson for today. I would like to offer you a discussion question, which is in the discussion, I would like to rate yourself from a scale from one to 10. One being not very and 10 being all the time. How self-aware are you of your emotions? That's question one. How much do you express your emotions? That would be a 10 versus suppress your emotions. That's a one. And how well do you, can you identify other people's emotions? So rate yourself from a one to 10. What would be really interesting is doing that now and then doing this practice and seeing what the difference might be in one week. Great. Your experiment is to try to expand your vocabulary around emotions. And I'm gonna offer you three different ways to do that. First one is a book. I mentioned Brene Brown's Atlas of the Heart. It's amazing. There are 87 different emotions listed in that book. And I've got a link to the worksheet that kind of lists out all of the ways that she helps categorize emotions. It's not the most usual one and it's really, really useful. So I'd love to offer you that as a resource. That's one way to expand your vocabulary. A second way is if your experience of emotion is more on intensity, I'm really, 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 really sad, or just a little bit sad, the Paul Ekman Atlas of Emotion is organized by intensity, and it's incredibly good. It gives you graphs to kind of show the emotional experience of low-level sadness versus really high, intense, sadness and depression. And it'll give you really good words to use for all of the different places in between. Fabulous resource. It's a web-based resource. And the last one is a printable. It's an emotion wheel or a feelings wheel developed by Wilcox. And it's used in counseling, therapeutic um, situations and all sorts of different areas. Um, it's really useful because it's just seven different categories and then it expands out to expand your vocabulary. So it takes fear and it branches out into all of these different realms of different kinds of fear, different nuances, different combinations. Again, ways to increase your vocabulary. So your experiment would be to learn some new words, to make some new distinctions and to practice that on yourself and others. And that's our lesson for today. Thank you so much for joining me. 
Take care, wonderful leaders.